You know, we're going to talk a little bit this morning about picking up the pieces. And I want you to turn your Bible with me to Genesis chapter 25. We're going to spend most of the time in Genesis. I do have a few other verses for you that will be on our PowerPoint throughout the course of the message. But I want to ask the Lord to be with us one more time just to open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to receive His goodness this morning. Father, you put this word on my heart. It's burning within me, Lord. I pray that the people that you have it for are ready to receive, that they're open, that they're hungry, that they're desperate for your presence, desperate for a word from you, that we can see your transformation taking place even throughout the course of this service. Thank you for being in our midst. Have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Talk to you for a few moments this morning about picking up the pieces after the damage has been done. Because all of you have been through tests, trials. Some come in the form of divorce, some unfaithfulness, some mistreatment. Stuff has been done to you that you didn't deserve. And then there's stuff that's been done to you that maybe you did deserve. There's things that you caused and things that you had nothing to do with. But the result that the enemy wants in every one of those situations is bitterness. He wants whatever happens to you to make you bitter. But I want to show you that God wants it to make you better. And so we're going to talk about picking up the pieces this morning. There's something so sweet about forgiveness. Amen? When you're guilty and you get forgiven, oh my goodness. And maybe it's a major thing that, that you're guilty of. And, and I, I think we understand it. The, the greater the crime, maybe the harder the forgiveness. The greater the infraction that's been done, maybe the, the harder uh, it is to give that forgiveness so freely. I think there, there's no other emotion that humans want to feel other than forgiveness. It is a weight off. It is a release. It is having chains and bonds and, and just bricks that you're dragging cut off of you. It, it's uh, so much more than just mere acceptance. Forgiveness is the salve that heals. When it's spread upon your wounds, your emotional wounds, it heals. It's, it's a pill that doesn't just give you momentary relief. It is permanent relief. It is healing. It's a protective hug that drives out fear that never lets go. There's nothing that is more satisfying in this life than being forgiven for something. Our, our launch verse this morning is John 10.10. 10. Read this with me on the screen. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And when you read that, Steal, kill, and destroy what? Fill in the blank. Us. Anything good. Steal innocence. To steal dreams. To steal hope. To steal our marriage. Steal our blessings. To steal our happiness. Anything that you would describe as an attribute of the goodness of God. You can go through the list of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Jesus don't want you living anywhere near that list. He wants to steal and kill and destroy every bit of that in your life. That's what he has for you. How does he destroy it? Conflict. He wants to get you in opposition to somebody else in your life. Now, before Pastor Shell and Sister Missy were with us last weekend, I spent a few weeks talking about a Christ-centered marriage, what a great marriage looks like. But today we're going to talk about conflict, picking up the pieces after a conflict, because you've got to understand, at some point, every piece right here, every piece that came out of Carson's toy bin was a part of something. You don't just go buy filler packs of Legos. I don't anyway. I go and buy boxes with a picture on it that come with instructions. And me and Carson, we spend, depending on the size and complexity of the object, anywhere from 30 to 90 minutes putting together something. A city, a, a dump truck with moving parts. All the, at some point, everything in this box came with instructions and was fit together perfectly to make some kind of vehicle or, or spaceship or whatever it might be. But here we see there was some kind of conflict Probably between a boy named Carson and a girl named Layla. <laughs> okay? And now we got to throw Nora in the mix because that little girl gets her hands on something. It's done. To her, Legos are meant to be pulled apart. <laughs> that's all they're for, right? And so this right here is the result of conflict, and that's what happened. Listen, our whole world is based on conflict. There are borders. There are county cities with specific lines that were resolved over some form of conflict. This is our border, whether you like it or not. You ever said this to somebody? Don't you cross that line. 
Don't you cross, you know what I'm saying? Don't come out of that circle. Maybe you say, don't cross that line in the car. That back seat, that's the boundary. Maybe you've used that. My dad used that with us. And so what do we want to do? We want to cross the line. We want the conflict. But conflict is always going to have results. Conflict is a part of life. Being mad. If you're close to somebody, they're as human as you are, there is going to be conflict. We know that God desires close relationships. He's the first one to institute the the institution of marriage. And when you get married, the first thing you do is to get engaged. And the only other proper term of the word engagement besides marriage is battle. You're either engaged to be married or you're engaged in battle. (laughs) And I think sometimes they have a lot more similarities than differences as you're working out your differences. Engagement is where you work it out, where you figure out what's your border, what's my boundary. Tell me what, you know what, you got to work out so you can sign that peace treaty and everybody's going to get along for a good happy marriage. That's what it's for. There is going to be conflict. It means taking part in that battle. It means working things out. It lets me know that conflict in some form may be a daily part of my life. Can I get an amen? Amen. Or an oh me. (laughs) But conflict is going to be a part. It's part of life on earth. But life according to John 10.10 is meant to be lived to the fullest, to the best, to the greatest level. It's referring to life on this earth and life to come. Jesus said, I came not just that you have life, but have it to the fullest, the most abundant life. That's what he wants you to have. Does that mean a life free of conflict? Probably not. We know in eternity we'll live a life without conflict. No tears, no pain, no sorrow. Amen? But we're not there yet. And so a lot of times conflict in this earth leads to sorrow. Conflict can destroy when not handled well. Loud vocal conflict can be destructive. But internalized festering conflict can also be destructive. Can it? You can nod at me. I, hey, y'all can talk back. Y'all can give me some amen, some oh me. That's okay. As our enemy, Satan is crouching somewhere in our lives waiting for the moment to spring, to trigger some conflict in your life, to cause something to go wrong, to get you to say and do something for which you might not ever receive forgiveness. Have you ever said something you know you shouldn't have said? You knew it was wrong before it came out of your mouth. Part of you is yelling in anger and the other part of you is saying, don't do it. You've been there. Your spirit is saying, don't do it. You're crazy. And your flesh is like, I'm right, not know it. And I'm going to. We've all been there. My goodness. And hopefully you've gotten past a lot of that and you're able to laugh with me. <laughs> if you're in the midst of it, it is not a laughing matter. Satan wants to destroy what God has made. So it's a no brainer to say he is after your marriage. If you're not married, I'm telling you, he's after anything that God does in your life. He's after success. He's after blessing. And not just politically. He's after uh, not marriage just, you know, uh, not just politically because we know that marriage is being redefined. But he's after marriage in the church. He's after the success of a Christian marriage. Yes, he's trying to destroy marriage by having some judge tell us that God is wrong and that man is right. But he wants you to doubt your marriage. He wants you to have a weak trouble-filled, conflict-filled marriage in the confines of your own home. He wants you to struggle personally along with your spouse. I read an interview in a Christian magazine that I get, and it said that a woman that had just gone through uh, a divorce, a Christian woman, felt like a modern-day Hester Prynne in her church, except rather than having a scarlet letter A on herself somewhere. She feels like she walked around church with a big capital D uh, ingrained into her forehead. And many of you have, have gone through that. Or maybe you know somebody that has. And rather than finding comfort in the church, she felt like it was a place that she needed to hide from. She was pitied by some, ignored by others, but rejected by most. Felt like she either had to look for a new church or just lay out for a while. So what does it feel like when you get rejection from the very place where you should have got protection? Because they, I don't, I don't know that I do this, but maybe I do. People say that the church shoots their wounded, that we don't try to heal our wounded. Rather than gathering around somebody that's had a failure, we kind of get around in a circle and point fingers. <laughs> maybe not literally, but that's kind of what we do with our lives. If somebody's different, if their home life is different, if their marriage is different, rather than trying to be a strength and a support to them, we kind of make an example of what not to be like. And that 
Again, it's conflict and it leads to division. Instead of finding a place to share burdens, people often find the church as a place where they need to hide from. Couples facing divorce, even individuals going through times of testing, often find it more comfortable to leave a church And I don't think that's what God has for us today. I think Satan is trying to still kill and destroy. I think he's after your marriage. And there's a few things that I want to give you this morning for just a few moments. Would you agree that Satan is after everything that God's doing? He is. So we agree on that. And he is after everything that God is doing and has done in your life. He wants you to be a mess. This is what he wants you to be. But I'm telling you, God is so good at picking up the pieces. But let's look at a few things that Satan is after this morning. Throw up that first line for me, Brother Gil. The enemy wants to steal your birthright. He wants to steal your identity. He wants to take everything that you know and believe about yourself. We talked a little bit about this in Sunday school this morning. That we're a result of how we were raised. And maybe you had a good upbringing, maybe a negative upbringing. But somehow you found yourself in the presence of God today. So the Lord allowed the steps of the history in your life to get you to his place to be a part of this body, either as a lifestyle or maybe you're a visitor today. But I'm here to tell you that Satan is after you to destroy every bit of hope, every bit of goodness, maybe the last strain of hope that you're holding out for saying, God, if you're real, I need you to show up. And 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 Satan wants you to doubt even that last effort to believe. He's trying to distill your birthright. In Genesis chapter 25, we're going to look and go all the way down to... Verse 24 of Genesis 25. It says, When her days to be delivered were fulfilled, were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. And now the first came forth red, all over like a hairy garment, and they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came forth with his hand holding on to Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob, and Isaac was 60 years when she gave birth to him. Go down to verse 29. When Jacob had cooked stew, Esau came in from a field, and he was famished. And Esau said to Jacob, Please let me have a swallow of that red stuff there, for I am famished. Therefore his name was called Edom, meaning red. But Jacob said, First sell me your birthright. Esau said, Behold, I'm about to die, so what use then is this birthright to me? And Jacob said, First swear to me. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went on his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Listen, Satan wants to destroy everything that led you to be in the presence of God. Everything that led you to want to be forgiven, to want to be restored, to want to have a happy marriage, to want to see God's calling on your life. There is an understanding usually in, in a young person raised up in a church to seek, what does God want me to be? What does God have for me? It's not nurtured in a lot of homes, but there is this desire to know what God's will is for our lives. Don't you want to know what God wants you to be, who God's called you to be? Satan doesn't even want you to care. Satan wants you to be so worried about uh, making money, so worried about making ends meet, having a house, so worried about what people think, having the right car, the right this, the right that, that you don't even worry about what God has for you. You're so concerned about what man has for you. But Satan wants to steal your birthright, your identity. Not only that, put up that next slide. He not only wants to steal your birthright, he wants to steal your sonship. He wants to take away your very sonship. How many of you know you were called to be a joint heir with Jesus Christ? A brother. A brother to rule and reign with Christ. That is your identity. You are called to be a royal priesthood, but we settle for so much less. Some of us never have any kind of priesthood, no kind of ministry. And this isn't just being called to the ministry. This is just saying, God, how can you use me? Lord, this is all I have, and I give it to you. But Satan wants you to feel so inadequate that you never allow God to use you to make an impact on anybody's life. And and listen, trials happen. Divorce happens. Sickness. Attacks happen. They do. You're going to be shaken. You're going to be tried. And Satan wants to destroy you with it. But are you going to let him? Or are you going to see, even in your moment of testing and trial, that God is still with you? Not only your sonship, put up the next one. And your inheritance. Man, that God has a blessing for you. God has a destiny for you. And Satan wants you to doubt that. The greatest inheritance that you're going to get from your Heavenly Father is eternity in His presence. 
Man, he wants to hand down a, mess, a mansion to you. A mansion that's sitting on a street of gold. But we get so tied up in the things of this world that we forget to even allow that part of our life to grow and to be developed because we're so caught up in the ways of this world. See, what happens that in a moment of weakness, he wants to cause you to say and do things that you would never do. He's going to use conflict with your closest friends, your closest family, to get you at your weakest. And what drains you and I in a relationship? What takes the momentum and strength out of a relationship more than conflict? Nothing. Nothing. See, Christina and I, we've gone through miscarriages. We've gone through losing my mom, my dad being disabled. We've, we've lost uh, family members, one of her aunts that was very young, uh, a preacher's daughter that never should have died. And we saw that play out in front of us. And those things can shake you. But those things don't take near as much energy from me and from her as when we're in discord. If there is disunity between us, it shakes us way more. Conflict does a whole lot more damage on us than any kind of loss, any kind of test. We've had financial woes. We have had hardships. We, we, we went through a very tough time about between uh, six and eight months of not really having any steady income before we came here. And it got tough, but it didn't shake our marriage. It drew us much closer together. But disunity and conflict, that can do a number on you. And Satan wants you to live in discord. He wants you to live in discord. He wants your house to be raised voices, tension, being upset. He wants you to be on edge all the time. He wants you to be without peace. He wants you to be without hope. He wants you to be just slamming doors and saying, well, I can't find peace here. I'm going somewhere where I can. He wants you to turn to alcohol. He wants you to turn to some other substance to find peace anywhere but God. That's what he has for you. That's Satan's plan. Satan's plan is alcoholism, uh, marital affairs, pornography. Those things that desensitize and they numb your mind and your emotions for just a time. That's what he has for you. And people all over the world are addicted to terrible substances. Not only the, the hard illegal drugs, the, the crack, the cocaine, the meth, all this stuff that they keep taking to another level to find greater highs. People get uh, addicted to things that they started taking from a doctor. And go to illegal methods to try to obtain that. Because they're in conflict and they won't find godly resolution. They're turning to medical or medicinal resolution. And Satan is absolutely okay with you being addicted to a bottle or to a pill. Because you're not turning to Jesus. And the church should be the place where you could come and find peace for whatever conflict is going on in your life. But is it? Satan is after you to steal your birthright. The second thing the enemy wants to steal, he wants to destroy your blessing. Turn to Genesis chapter 27 quickly. Just a few pages in. Go to verse 30. Now it came about as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, Jacob had hardly gone out from the presence of Isaac his father, that Esau the brother came in from hunting, and then also had made some savory food. He brought it to his father and said to his father, Let my father arise and eat his son's game, that you may bless me. Isaac, had fa his father, said to him, Who are you? He said, I'm your firstborn, your, your son Esau. Then Isaac trembled violently and said, Who was the, he then that hunted game and brought it to me so that I ate it before you came and blessed him? Yes, and he shall be blessed. And when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me even also, O my father. And he said, Your brother came deceitfully and has taken away your blessing. And then he said, Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he has taken away my blessing. Have you not reserved a blessing for me also? The enemy wants to destroy your blessing. Satan wants you to lose hope in people. He wants you to lose hope in God. Sin is crouched like a tiger at your door to devour you. But he that is in you is greater than he that crouches, is greater than he that lies, is greater than he that, de that deceives. The hope and the joy of Jesus Christ are greater than your worst problem. But Satan is going to get right up in your face and try to make his molehill seem bigger than the mountain. And that's when you learn to walk by faith and not by sight. Because if you live by sight, the earth seems a bigger problem than God can handle. 
Oh my goodness, they're redefining marriage. What is God going to do? God's going to continue to be God and bless those that will continue to live by his word. That's what God's going to do. God's going to continue to do what he's always done. He's going to give man a chance to find redemption and repentance and still bestow his blessings upon those few faithful that will live according to his word. So where are you going to live? In conflict? According to the ways of the enemy of your soul that wants to drag you to hell? Or according to the word of God? Where forgiveness comes by giving forgiveness. And by believing, not in what we see, but what the word of the Lord says to our hearts. See, God wants to take every bit of peace out of your relationships. He wants your marriage to be on the rocks. Man, he wants you to be uncomfortable. He wants you to be embarrassed. And listen, we all do it. You hear somebody in public having a conflict. (laughs) Maybe me, (laughs) because I'm still learning. You hear somebody... uh, Getting on to this person, raising their voice in public, and immediately like, whoo, I'm glad we're not them. And rather than going and being an agent of encouragement, and maybe it's not the best time to say, hey, I heard you guys fighting. Can I pray with you? Maybe that's not going to go away. Maybe that's not the way to do it. But instead of saying, whoo, man, I'm glad. What if you just right there in that moment prayed over that family? Rather than thinking you got the solution and you got it right, why not allow God to have his will? Somehow, if the Lord says, you know what, go up and speak to that man and say, man, I'm praying for you guys. Don't give up. See, something goes wrong in a marriage. People think, hey, man, 199, divorce right here. Uncontested. They think it's an easy way out when God never wanted that to happen. Does divorce happen? Absolutely divorce happens almost half the time. It's not God's will. And we don't know the details. You're not in that marriage. You don't know what kind of abuse and mistreatment might be going on. Sometimes divorce might be the escape, and you don't know. But that should never be the first option. God wants to take the peace. I mean, Satan wants to destroy the peace in your relationship. And he wants you to lose the gifts that God wants to give you. He wants you to have unused talents that you take to your grave. God has given us all a measure of talent. How are you using them? God wants you to have no hope, no trust, no peace. Satan wants you to live in that way. Opposite of what God has for you. Now turn to one more passage. Genesis 33. A few more pages as we get close to the end. You guys with me? I just never know, man. You get a few amens and a whoo, you know, you know that they're with you. But I just, I want to make sure I'm not distru- disturbing y'all's naps. Now you know I'm just kidding with you. Y'all can wait and sleep after lunch during the business meeting. Y'all know I'm playing. Pastor being a little sarcastic. Listen, this is good preaching that the Lord put on my heart, and I want to make sure that I give this to you clearly today. Genesis chapter 33, look at verse 4. This says, Then Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. These are the two brothers. One that was lying his way to steal everything. The other that wanted to kill the other one because he lost everything. He ran to him, embraced him, fell on his neck, and kissed him, and they wept. This is almost verbatim what the prodigal son's father did to him during their restoration. That's the kind of love that was present. Yeah, there was a lot of deceit, and there was a lot of hurt, but somewhere down the road, six chapters in, after a lot of life, after a lot of trials, there is restoration here. Verse 5, he lifted his eyes and saw the woman and the children and said, Who are these with you? So he said, the children whom God has graciously given your servant. Then the maids came near and their children, and they bowed down. Leah likewise came near with her children, and they bowed down. And afterward, Joseph uh, came near with Rachel, and they bowed down. And he said, what do you mean by all this company which I have met? And he said, to find favor in the sight of my Lord. But Esau said, I have plenty my brother, let what you have be your own. And Jacob said, no, please, if I have found favor in your sight, then take my present from my hand, for I see your face as one sees the face of God, and you have received me favorably. Favorably. The enemy wants to kill your hope for a future. Yes, you messed up. Yes, you have been angered. You have been mistreated. I get it. Some people are treated unjustly. Some people have have had people be unfaithful to you uh, in business, in marriage. Those kind of things happen. You live in a sinful world that has turned their back on God. And it is your desire and it is your job to live for God in the midst of a sinful world. You're not home. This isn't how it's going to be for all eternity, but it's how it is in the present. So how are you going to react to every attack of the enemy? By getting bitter or by getting better? Jacob could have ran for his whole life saying, there is no hope. 
I'll never, I'll never be right with Esau. But he humbled himself. Esau, in his own right, had the, the heart to restore and to forgive. And in that moment, Jacob's hope was restored. He said, no, 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 dude, dude, take these gifts, bro. It's like seeing the face of God that you have forgiven me. I'm telling you, forgiveness is amazing. It's like seeing the face of God. It's like, whoo, man. Oh, I didn't know if I'd ever get that off my chest. Confession is healing. Forgiveness is healing. See, Satan wants to kill every hope that you have for a future, every hope that you ever have for restoration, every hope that you might have for a damaged marriage, every hope that you might have, let's say you lost a marriage, and you might feel like, well, I'll never have a chance at love again. That's a lie from the devil. God absolutely has somebody for you if you allow him to lead you. He doesn't ever want you to see or sense the presence of God in your life. He wants you to be blindfolded by doubt, fear, regret, and shame. He wants you to be focused on how people mistreated you, not what God wants to do through you in spite of that. He wants you to think about how people lied to you, hurt you, twisted things that, that had been done to you to make you look bad. But even think about the Lord's Prayer that many young boys repeat before every sporting event. Forgive us our trespasses or sins as we forgive those that have trespassed against us, that have sinned against us. That's a part of the Lord's Prayer. The enemy wants you to lose hope for forgiveness. He wants you to lose hope for an eternity with God. Can you imagine going through life without the hope of eternity in heaven? I can't imagine that. I can't imagine that. I tolerate a lot of these things on this earth, a lot of these things from my government because I know it's temporal. There's a lot of things that I don't like that go on in this society that will not go on in the kingdom of God. Amen? But there are people that live without that hope, that think this is it, that think it ends in the ground or think they're going to come back as a cow. I mean, it happens. And we have the hope. So shouldn't we live like we have the hope? Shouldn't we resolve conflict knowing there's something more important than being right or making our point or making sure they feel bad for what they did to us? There's something more important than that. Restoration. Forgiveness. Man, I've been mistreated just like any of you guys. Maybe not to the level. I have the most amazing wife that puts up with a lot to stay married to me. God's been good to me, but I've been mistreated. I've been lied about. It's not fun. It leaves scars. It makes you kind of skittish. When you open up your heart to people and they turn that against you, man, it's a little harder the next time. And it can make you bitter or it can make you better. But I'm telling you, Satan wants you to lose hope for forgiveness and redemption. Satan wants you to lose sight of eternity with God and become wrapped up in the wrongs of this world. That's what Satan wants. And so if that's where you are, you're living for him and not for God. Don't you hold unforgiveness over somebody's head. You are not the judge. Whatever measure you judge with, that's going to be dumped on your head. You ready for that? That's the Pastor Keith version. I just love you, church. I would hate to think that somebody that goes through a hardship would come into this church and not feel accepted and loved and encouraged, but would feel ridiculed and judged and ignored. Because there's imperfect people. There are people whose marriages are on the rocks in this place today. There are people who have been hurt, who have been mistreated. There are people stuck in addiction right now, and they don't need to be stared at and laughed at and jeered at and treated like an example. They, needed to be, they need to be embraced and supported. Scripture says to bear one another's burdens. That is how you fulfill the law of Christ. Jesus wasn't a finger pointer. He didn't make an example of anybody. In fact, he hung out with all the people that would make him look bad because he wanted them to see what love was like. Satan wants to destroy your hope. Not only are we keeping the person that we're holding an offense over from being forgiven, we're keeping ourselves from being forgiven. We want people to be sorry for what they've done to us. We want people to feel bad for their mistakes. But you made mistakes. And if Jesus pointed his finger at us, one of the few times he did, and says, let he who is without sin cast the first stone, where would you be in that argument? Because there's a lot of people that say, you did some wrong to them. Because there are no perfect people in this place. 
If that's our attitude, I think we've missed the heart of our Father who desires us to be a place of compassion. We're meant to be a place of restoration, to give care. Not a place of tolerance. Don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about tolerating sin. But we absolutely tolerate sinners. And we embrace sinners. And hurting people. Christians that are going through tough situations. We absolutely embrace and build up. See, we're meant to be builders, not breakers, church. We're meant to be builders. My little kids, they see so much more fun in destroying, but it just takes a little time. You can grab a few pieces here or there, and the, the, the pieces begin to line up. Even an untrained Lego worker like myself, you sift through some of these pieces. Now, I did have Carson build this kind of truck to say, hey, look, this is what happens with someone with some skill puts their hands to it. Listen, this is your life. This is your life. But all these pieces with some patience in the hands of the right father can become something beautiful again. Amen? If you're taking notes, write down these last few scriptures before we pray this morning. James 2.13 states clearly, mercy triumphs over judgment. It's in Scripture. What do you lead with, mercy or judgment? Mercy triumphs over judgment. Galatians 6.2, I mentioned this already, carry each other's burdens and then this way you fulfill the law of Christ. Rebuilding a life takes longer than destroying one. Amen? And so when somebody comes in here with problems and they didn't get it right all of a sudden, don't make an example. Don't look down on them. Be a part of the healing process. If we're the hands and feet of Christ, listen, Jesus' hands never threw a stone, never called somebody out for being imperfect, just challenged them to go and sin no more. We lead them to the truth and help them to live by the truth. Romans 12, 12, a beautiful verse. Listen to this. Be joyful in hope, be patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. Rebuilding takes longer than destroying I could probably destroy whatever these were in a matter of moments, but it would take hours to rebuild. And that's a lot how life is. A, a, a divorce or a broken life or a lost job or hurt feelings or a scarred emotional life might have happened in a matter of seconds, but it could take years to get over. Stealing the birthright took a matter of moments. Stealing the blessing took a few hours. Restoring that relationship took about six chapters, about 14 to 15 years, okay? You understand what I'm saying? What happens in a matter of moments or hours might take a matter of years for it to be restored, but you better be ready to be a, be a part of that process because that's what God has for you as his church because none of you are perfect and every single one of you need the other to help be a part of their healing process, amen? Can you bow your heads with me this morning?